from Are You Running With Me, Jesus? We can't make it alone, Jesus. God knows we've tried, and we've even reached the point where we could blow up everybody, including ourselves. Teach us how to listen carefully and patiently to other people. Teach us to, how to say that what we have to say clearly, simply, and openly. Teach us what responsibility towards you and others really means. Cut through all our egoism and self-interest, Jesus. Make us understand what patriotism must mean in one world of conflicting nationalisms. Educate us to support community wherever it brings people together in a shared sense of human concern. Work with us, Christ, to bridge gulfs and divisions between nations and persons. And such is an intense interest of the teachings and the life of the early church. I would suggest that the passage that Bobby just read for us from the book of Acts is the most important passage of the New Testament, of the early church, as it relates to our life together. And whoever wrote and later compiled and edited the book of Acts must agree, because in this short sparse history of the early church, the story of Peter and Cornelius take up a full two chapters. There's the chapter, there's the story that Bobby just read, and then the whole story is repeated again as Peter reports to his colleagues in the church what is happening and what took place. Things are not repeated in Scripture unless there's a reason for repeating them. Acts is the second volume of two volumes attributed to Luke. So the first volume, what do you think the first volume would be? Luke, very good. I was just, I was just trying to make sure y'all were, were awake and with me this morning. Yeah, so Luke is the, the history of Jesus and the disciples. And then the second volume is the, is the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church. And in both Luke and Acts, one of the understandings of how we experience the divine and engage one another is through hospitality. If you remember one of the stories of the resurrection are, are two companions walking down the road where they are joined by a stranger who ends up being the risen Christ. And they don't realize that until that, that one comes into their home and breaks bread with them. And so when we think of hospitality, our understanding of it's kind of benign. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's having nice dishes when we have our friends and our family over. And it's, it's picking up a few new recipes from Martha Stewart to share with others or to bring to a potluck. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the understanding of hospitality and antiquity was much more radical there was this understanding that hospitality was necessary for survival, and in many cases it was. When a stranger came into a community, that stranger would be invited to someone's house for a meal, for at least a meal, sometimes for an overnight stay, sometimes with giving them gifts as they continued their journey. In fact, it was considered rude to even ask for somebody's last name and story 
before you had served them that initial meal. That's what hospitality was in those ancient times. And in the early church, we kind of see a struggle taking place between wanting to share that hospitality and following the other rules of the faith tradition. So remember we talked about a couple weeks ago the rules that were laid out for the people of Israel in Leviticus, which were important for survival and were important for community. It dictated what kind of foods that they could eat. There were some foods that were in and some foods that were out, probably relating to, say, food production at that time. We remember that they were a small tribe in the midst of other tribes, so having enough people was important. So there was an admonition against any sexual activity that didn't produce children. So that including, included same-gender relationships or, or anything else where there was sexual pleasure without the possibility of production of children. We'll leave it at that. We don't need to go into details. I'm sure you can understand that. And so there are these rules in place. And so something funny happened when, when people started following Jesus. There was some question about who should be allowed into this faith community and who shouldn't be allowed into this faith community. The early understanding was that, that Jesus was a spiritual teacher that came to those that were Jewish to reform and to, to give hope within the confines of that tradition. But what happened was the word got out about who Jesus was and this, this new life, this new understanding of the possibility of connection with God, with the divine. And so other people were attracted to that, such as Cornelius in this morning's story. And so Cornelius was praying at three o'clock that's a significant time. It was one of the times of, of, of prayer. And we're told that he has this vision, this dream. All throughout Luke and Acts, there's these, these stories of visions and dreams, a way that God communicates and reveals truth that, that might need to be snuck past those defenses that we usually have up. And he's told to go and see this one named Peter, this leader in the early church, this gatekeeper for this spiritual movement. And we're told the next day at noon, when Peter was praying, and praying on an empty stomach, it seems like, because he had a dream about food. But it wasn't just any kind of food. So Peter has this dream that there's a, a sheet or a, maybe a picnic blanket, as it were, that fell down from heaven, and all of these different foods appeared on it. Foods like maybe bacon and ham and lobster, things that were forbidden for Peter to eat in his faith tradition. And he hears the word of God, the word of God says to him, Peter, go and take and eat. And Peter, might have been thinking this was some kind of test or something, said, no way, God, I'm not going to do that. Those foods are unclean. There are rules and laws in place that says I'm not supposed to eat those things. I'm not going to do it. And so Peter hears the voice again. You're hungry, Peter, there's food available. Take and eat. And Peter once again says, no, God. God forbid that I do that. And then, of course, because everything happens in threes in the life of Peter, God says again, take and eat. And Peter takes and eat. So, we might think a, not think a whole lot about that, 
But for Peter, in his faith tradition, this changed everything. So God is saying to Peter, God is saying to that early church, there were some rules in place. I'm changing my mind. I'm going to change these rules. And so it was later that afternoon that Cornelius, the, the Gentile, the non-Jew, the outsider, the other, came to Peter's house. Actually, it wasn't Peter's house. Peter was being offered hospitality by Simon the Tanner. And so Simon had said, Peter can stay here. And then Peter said, well, Cornelius, you can come in and stay here too. I'm not sure what Simon thought about that. But Cornelius' men were welcomed into this house. And eventually, Cornelius was brought in to this faith movement. Such an important landmark in our story as the church. What might have been questionable before is now allowed is now welcomed, is now not just tolerated, but celebrated. Of course, in our history as people of faith, as the church, we haven't always lived in to that story. It seems like, as Malcolm Boyd have observed in his prayer, that there always has to be an other that there always has to be someone else, that we can't fully appreciate the benefits of what's available to us from the divine if there isn't somebody else that we can leave to the side and leave out and say that they aren't deserving of this. This month, as we celebrate pride, I think we would be remiss if we, as the church, didn't confess that all too often that has been our story and that has been the case in our treatment of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and other communities. We go back to these rules and you say, no, it's, it's written right here that, that this isn't allowed. And as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, those texts are, are vague at best. But let's say for a moment, even if 3,000 years ago in the purity cold codes of an ancient people, something wasn't allowed. What if God was changing God's mind for the benefit of a radically hospitable community where everyone is invited to the table, where everyone is welcome, where there is no other. I think that's what, what Paul was getting at in this passage from Galatians. He was saying, okay, in Christ now, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no gay or straight. There is no Democrat or Republican. Does that mean we lose our identities? Not at all. It means that we are all one in Christ and that we don't define one another by our differences as much as we do our common love and our common mission together. So how in the world do we do that? Do we just say that's the way it is and, and go on? No, not at least in our experience. It's difficult. 
it's nearly impossible outside of these walls as we've experienced over the past several years. But it's difficult even within, even with people with the best of intentions. So how do we go about doing it? Just a few things this morning, and we'll talk more about this next week. But, but one of the ways is by telling our story. That's why I was, I was just captured by um, Malcolm Boyd this, this week and, and reading these prayers that I haven't read in years, maybe decades. But expressing ourselves, telling about our experience, telling about the ways that we view life. We're going to go deeper into that next week because I think it's so important. And I know today is, is review for a lot of us, but we're going to push the envelope a little bit next week as, as we talk about why the church needs queer Christians. But we need views from a variety of people in places with different skin colors and different cultures and sexual orientations and gender identities to capture an understanding of the whole. We need to tell our stories. We need to listen to the stories that are being told. We need to create safety. We need to create space and time in order to let those stories be revealed, to let those stories breathe. We'll learn something. We'll experience something new. And then finally for this morning, I think we need to learn the art of forgiveness. You know, we have done some horrible things to one another over the course of history. I think within communities of faith, we have the opportunity in a relatively safe space to confess those sins, to confess the ways that we have mistreated one another and excluded one another. And then in that safety, in that confession, have the opportunity to forgive one another. To hear our stories, to learn our perspectives, and then to take the opportunity to forgive. In closing, another prayer from Malcolm Boyd. Words, not just to Jesus, although it's a prayer to Jesus, but, but words to us is the church. Talking about his relationship with his partner. And remember, this being written and published and on the shelves of good Christian folk in 1965. May we have your blessing, Jesus. I come to mark my partner, not filled with sound and fury in the lies of the world. I come to him naked, early morning eyes and tasseled hair. He knows my snoring, my morning feet shuffling toward coffee. I come to him as I am. Unvarnished floor, unframed picture, a face that needs a shave, a character with flaws. May we have your blessing, Jesus. The truth of the matter, of course, is Malcolm Boyd and his husband Mark have Jesus' blessings. The question is, do they have our blessings? Do we approach people that are different from us that are at a different place on the, the neurodiversity continuum, that have a different skin color than we do, that love differently than we do. And despite those differences, despite things that we sometimes don't even understand, do they have our blessing? 
Do we simply tolerate them? Or do we welcome them in and celebrate them and realize that our, even our nature as a community of people is going to change and transform because of their presence in it? What an example for the world. What an invitation from the divine for transformation. Let's pray together.